Good morning. Biology 1302, Biology for Majors, Chapter 7, DNA Structure and Gene Function. How is DNA made and what does it do? All right, so DNA is a molecule, which is a type of nucleic acid. Uh, all the cells' DNA, uh, or all cells use DNA to store genetic information, which is what the cell needs to produce proteins. Remember from last time, DNA is housed in the nucleus, and these structures called chromosomes. Each one of these chromosomes can be unwound, produce a gene. The gene, what is it that genes do? Genes ultimately make proteins. Uh, biologists determined the structure of DNA in 1965 by studying chemistry uh, and using X-ray diffraction to see how um, atoms were arranged. If you remember last time when we were talking about the history of DNA and we talked about a bunch of people and we talked about uh, this lady right here, Rosalind Franklin. I told you to remember her name because it would be very important coming up. Uh, these are the gentlemen, uh, number C, uh, number, uh, picture B, that is some of the x-ray uh, uh, crystallography that Ms. Franklin did uh, using that x-ray crystallography. Uh, Watson and Crick, which are these two gentlemen, I believe, uh, receiving their Nobel Prize for production. You will notice conspicuous in her absence is Ms. Franklin, who did most of the work. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, Nobel Prize is only giving to living people, and Ms. Franklin had passed away by the time uh, this was done. Uh, by the time the Nobel Prize was awarded, she had passed away, therefore she did not get her name on the Nobel Prize, even though a bulk of the work that Watson and Crick used uh, to develop this model, which is what they got the Nobel Prize for, they would never have done it had it not been for Ms. Franklin. If you remember in a previous chapter, I told you at the time you know, that she was doing this, but she didn't fully understand what she was seeing and that Watson and Crick could better analyze and do the math better, and they were able to see what was going on. So DNA is composed of nucleotides. We talked about this in a previous chapter. You have the nitrogenous base. Uh, this just happens to be a DNA molecule. This is the sugar is deoxyribose. So you see the nitrogenous base. Uh, we talked about adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Um, these specialized covalent bonds join together to form strands. Uh, each DNA molecule is made of two strands of nucleotides, therefore it is referred to as a double helix. Uh, again, the two strands are aligned parallel to each other but they're oriented in opposite directions. In other words, one, set, one, slight, one strand is going down while the other is going up is a better way to say it. Uh, think of the northbound and southbound lanes of a highway. Uh, one of them is referred to as the lagging strand and one of them is referred to as the leading strand. Again, nitrogenous bases in one DNA strand form hydrogen bonds with the nitrogenous bases in the other which holds the two strands together. Again, remember, adenine always pairs with thymine. Cytosine always pairs with guanine, ergo Chargoff's law. Uh, because complementary base pairs, uh, the sequence of DNA strand determines the sequence of each other. Uh, one strand determines the uh, sequence of the other. Uh, DNA is wound up, again, in these structures called chromosomes. Uh, each chromosome is a discrete package of DNA coiled around proteins. Uh, remember you have this protein here called the centromere that holds these two together. DNA were two in one line, it would be too long to fit inside the cell. Uh, again, central dogma explains the encoding. So you have two processes. You have transcription, which takes, in, takes place inside the nucleus. You have translation, which takes place in the cytoplasm. So you start with DNA, the DNA is used to produce the RNA, RNA is then used to make proteins. Uh, a gene is a small segment of the chromosome. So here's the DNA right here, and the DNA makes the RNA. Now a small segment of each one of this RNA is what makes the protein. The DNA, or the sequence of DNA uh, in each gene encodes for a specific protein. So again, RNA is a little bit different. The base pairs of DNA on the far right, you see adenine uh, will pair with, uh, in, you have an adenine in your DNA, 
you will have a uracil in your RNA. Uracil replaces thymine in RNA. There's no thymines in RNA. Cytosine still pairs with guanine. Guanine still pairs with cytosine. And if your DNA carries a thymine, it still pairs with adenine. Uh, adenine in RNA pairs with uracil in DNA, or excuse me, in the other RNA. Cytosine and guanine still are the same. The other difference is if you have a uracil in one RNA in the complementary side of the RNA or the anticodon, we'll talk about those in a minute, you have adenine. Uh, three RNAs interact with each other. Uh, you have messenger RNA, which carries the information from the nucleus to the uh, ribosomes for the production of a particular protein. Transfer RNA carries the amino acids to the correct spot along the growing chain of the new protein. And then ribosomal RNA, which is part of the ribosome, which is the physical location where translation occurs. Again, this takes place in the, um, the, the cytoplasm of the cell. A little structure down here at the bottom, little picture B, is sort of a, a giving you an idea of uh, what transcription and translation is. Uh, you see uh, transcription is going to take place in the nucleus. Uh, so that's a cookbook. Transcription, you, read, you open the cookbook and you find a recipe for brownies. All right. So the brownie is going to be your messenger RNA. The messenger RNA goes under translation. Everything you need for that for those brownies can be found uh, in <clears throat> the cytoplasm of the cell. That's going to be your amino acid. So you've got some salt, some flour, some sugar, some butter, some cocoa, and some eggs. You put those all and put them up together, form in a pan, put them in the oven, and you wind up making the protein. You see this dramatization would be brownies. Uh, instructions are in the DNA. Plan uses the DNA to synthesize the transcription or the transcript, and then the transcript is translated into the new protein. All right. Um, transcription is a set of chemical reactions that occurs in the nucleus, uh, forms the molecules of RNA. Again, it's like opening a cookbook to a particular page and copying just the recipe you need and then closing the cookbook back. Uh, to make RNA, base pairings take special RNA to DNA nucleotides. Again, if, you, if the DNA says A, the RNA is going to be a U. It's going to replace the T. Uh, but C and G don't change. If the uh, DNA has a thymine, then the complementary base for that is adenine. Again, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, RNA promoter region, that's where the uh, RNA is going to combine. Uh, we have the RNA polymerase is going to read. It's making the RNA. Uh, all of these things are happening inside the nucleus of the cell. Transcription takes place in three steps. Initiation, when the RNA polymerase binds to the DNA. DNA polymerases have opened this gap. That was done by DNA polymerase. This is an RNA polymerase, which is going to read one side of that and produce the messenger RNA. Uh, then you have elongation. Uh, that's where the new DNA strand is being made. As this is moving, uh, more and more of this DNA will open up, allowing for this chain to grow longer and longer. Then there will be a termination area where there will be no signal being sent, and the RNA polymerase will release and the transcript will be fully formed at that point. Uh, so there's just a more detailed look at initiation. Uh, again, you have the promoter region, which is where the RNA polymerase is going to attach. Again, the DNA is being opened up by DNA polymerase, and it will continue until it gets to the terminator. Uh, just a more detailed look at elongation. Uh, again, we're looking at three groups here. Each three faces is called a codon. Each codon has a anticodon, which is where the uh, amino acid will attack eventually. Um, RNA polymerase joins the RNA nucleotides together in that growing strand. Again, it's a much more detailed picture. And then termination and release 
RNA polymerase reaches the end of its gene, which is called the terminator. Uh, the, the, the sequence of opening the DNA will cease, and when the RNA polymerase gets to this spot where no more of the DNA is open, it will release and go back into the cytoplasm of the cell, or cytoplasm of the nucleus. Uh, RNA complete, here we have a transcript or a messenger RNA. Um, this is the product from which a protein will be produced. Uh, RNA processes takes place in the nucleus. Once transcription is complete, the transcript will exit the nucleus through a nuclear pore and go out into the cytoplasm of the cell. And again, it's just a much more detailed view of here's the original DNA, makes the transcript, uh, the initiation step, here's all the new messenger RNA, introns are removed, we'll talk about that in just a moment, you're left with your mature messenger RNA that's going to exit the cell. Uh, at the end of each uh, new transcript, a cap structure is added, uh, it's called a poly A tail, uh, this is a chain of 50 to 300 or so uh, and, uh, uh, molecules of the same amino acid. Uh, a cap and tail to protect mes the messenger RNA from denigration. Uh, this is the cap structure is added on this end, poly A tail on the far end. Uh, within the message, uh, within that messenger RNA, the pre messenger RNA, uh, there are going to be structures called introns and exons. Uh, exons are se uh, sequences that specifically code for a specific amino acid. Introns don't code for anything. They are DNA sequences in specific genes that are not used to produce pro, uh, a protein. Uh, they used to be called uh, junk DNA. We don't refer, we don't use that term anymore uh, because we're finding more and more about that, you know, these things do play a role. They're just not playing a role in um, protein production. So they're going to be removed uh, in, during processing uh, the introns are removed, then all the exons are stuck back together to make a, a shorter, more compact structure, but it still has the cat and it still has the poly A tail. Uh, the process of RNA is now a functional molecule, so the functional transcript is going to exit the cell and move on into uh, the cytoplasm of the cell. It's going to exit the nucleus and move on into the cytoplasm of the cell. So there we see transcription takes place here inside the nucleus, then it will be transcript exits through a nuclear pore, and translation is going to occur in the outer region. Um, here is a demonstration or a drawing of how the, uh, everything works. Here's your template. There's the DNA, and you see T and A, T, A, C, G, A. There's uracil. G, C, T, A. There's another uracil down here. And then that messenger RNA is going to be broke down into three letter combinations. Uh, those three letter combinations are called codons. And each three letter codon uh, is going to be specific for a particular amino acid. Uh, it just so happens that AAG is the code for lysine. UCA is the code for serine. GUC is the codon for valine. And there are many, many others. Uh, this is a nice little chart. Uh, I will not ask you to commit this to memory. Uh, there are a couple I do want you to remember. Uh, right here, uh, the start codon. Uh, this is the one that starts the process. So every gene that's made for the production of protein starts off with AUG. The way you remember the start codon is during what month does school typically start for the school year? August. The abbreviation for August is AUG. That's the start codon. It also happens to be the codon for an amino acid called methionine. Over here, you see UAA, UAG, and UGA all say stop. These are referred to as stop codons. So, Every gene, every messenger RNA produced will begin with AUG and it will end with one of these three. Now keep in mind the poly A tail is also going to be beyond the stop codons. 
But the stop codon is what stops the production of protein. All right, so here's transfer RNA. Here's methionine. Here's the transfer RNA. The methionine is connected to it. And there's AUG. The structure right here on the transfer RNA that is the complementary base sets for the codon is referred to as the anti-codon. That is the, what it's going to attach here to bring this methionine in for its um, production. Uh, you see here, each ribosome has two subunits. You see a small subunit, a large subunit. Here's the transfer RNA. Here's the anti-codon attaching to the codon, bringing methionine into the growing protein. So the first thing that happens is the small ribosomal unit binds to the messenger RNA. That will bring in the first of the transfer RNAs, and then the large ribosomal unit will come in and start the process. Again, we have three steps. We have initiation. Uh, initiation starts the process where you have this leader sequence. This is the cat that we talked about. There's the first codon, the start codon, the binding gets added, and then that methionine will attach. The next codon is red, the transfer RNA bringing its initial codon, that looks like glycine, gets attached. When this peptide bond forms here between these two amino acids, the bonds holding this together will break, which will allow this amino acid then to move out of the way, making room for the next one. Uh, ultimately, we get all the way to termination and release, where here's your stop codon. At that point, the release factor uh, is the release factor protein is, is encountered, and the, R, the ribosome will release. Uh, again, a more detailed look at initiation. Uh, where we just talked about that. There's the methionine being added to the chain with the large subunit coming in and attaching. Now the amino acids are positioned directly next to each other. In the next slide, we'll talk about the peptide bond being formed. And then when the peptide bond forms, the, the transfer RNA will release. This is going to go back out into the cytoplasm, find another methionine to grab a hold of. And that allows for this one to come in and the cysteine to attach to the lysine. And we just continue all the way until we get to, again, the stop codon and the release factor. Uh, polypeptide detaches from the messenger RNA and folds into a functional protein. So this originally forms as a long straight chain. Uh, then it will be released and it will start to fold and twist in a very particular pattern based on whatever uh, protein that happens to be. Uh, this, this is actually a photo micrograph of protein production underway. Uh, this is an artist's rendering of it. This is the first one that attached way down here and it started reading and making a protein. And then this one attached and it started and this one and this one and this one and this one. Every little green dot you see here represents a ribosome. Every little purple chain running off represents a protein. Uh, when you see this down here, where it says transmission electron microscope with false color, that simply means that this uh, particular set sample has been treated with something to make things more visible. Basically, if you, we didn't treat these, everything would look like this, and you wouldn't see anything. So uh, we treat the messenger RNA with one chemical, the ribosomes with another, and the protein with a third. That allows for uh, the, the message to be seen. So the way it's sometimes done, sometimes it's simply done by computer where somebody says, okay, everything that looks like this, color it this, click. Everything that looks like this, color it this, click. And everything that looks like this, give it this color, click, and the computer does the coloring for us. Uh, again, back to our tape mix analogy or our brownie analogy, uh, the process of putting all the ingredients together and doing any final folding or twisting or whatever happens to do before you get the brownies and the proteins. Um, your red blood cells express hemoglobin, but your pancreas cells express insulin. 
Therefore, that's how we control our blood sugar. Again, all cells have ways to control the rate and timing of transcription. Uh, eukaryotic cells often control the rate and timing of translation. Uh, prokaryotes regulate transcription of several genes at once. Uh, this is a bacterial cell of some sort. You see it has the one large chromosome. This is something called the LAC operon. Uh, you have a LAC operon as well. Uh, again, this is a process where you have a promoter region, you have an operator region, and you have three different uh, genes that encode that break down lactose. Uh, the lac operon includes three genes that include that encode lactose digesting enzymes. Uh, a repressor normally is going to uh, bind to the DNA, which blocks RNA polymerase and forgets and, and prevents transcription. So if you have no lactose present, this is a, this is a type of control. Uh, it's control. You're controlling the presence of this. If you don't have any lactose in your system, you're not making lactose. The presence of lactose actually starts the production. So no lactose, no transcription, no transcription, no translation. However, if lactose is present, the lactose actually pulls the repressor protein off, allowing the RNA polymerase to bind at the promoter and to start producing the genes which are going to produce the lactone digesting enzymes, which will be produced during translation. So the lactose being present pulls the repressor off, transcription can proceed, and we get those lactose digesting enzymes. Uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, in eukaryotes, gene, reg gene, gene regulation starts in the nucleus. Uh, some genes are wound up very tightly, cannot be used for transcription, but other genes are available. And here again, here's that picture of the introns, the exons, the introns get removed left with the exon, and again, you still have the cap and the poly A tail. Uh, this process is affected by the activity of RNA polymerase, alters the rate of transcription. Again, there we have the picture of removal of the unused portion. So we want to make this item that has to exit the cell, we want or exit the nucleus, we want it to be as compact as possible. And then there's the, uh, the end product where certain eukaryotes can hold messenger RNAs inside the nucleus, preventing them from reaching a ribosome. Uh, some RNA molecules may be quickly degraded before they can be translated into very much protein. Uh, others are long-lived and translates a lot of protein. So uh, again, ways to regulate the production of proteins. Uh, some proteins are more stable, therefore they can uh, produce more product, while others degrade quickly. Uh, moreover, in order to function, proteins must be properly folded, and they must reach their correct cellular location. So protein processing and degradation, that occurs at a different part of the cell. Uh, mutations. Mutations uh, are a change in the nucleotide sequence of the cell's DNA. Uh, you will notice that uh, in this particular view, we see a scanning electron microscope view of the head of a fruit fly. Uh, a particular uh, mutation was um, caused to happen in this fruit fly. And you see on the left, fruit flies are supposed to, on the front of their face in between their eyes, are supposed to have uh, a pair of antennae. However, the mut mutation being shown here, instead of growing antenna, antennae from their face, they're actually growing a new pair of legs from their face. That is a mutation, a permanent change in the DNA. Uh, point mutations. Uh, a substitution or point mutation is where one codon is altered. So only one amino acid is affected protein may or may not retain the ability to function. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all the steps uh, on this, but you see the one big fly had one red eye, and then we change the substitution to Q. Uh, and so you now the word, the, the second word doesn't make any sense. So there's all different types of transmissions here. 
You see, this is a single point. Uh, the second would be a deletion of three mem uh, three different nucleotides. You see the word fly has been deleted, so now we have the one big had one red eye. Uh, that next one is an insertion, the one big wet, the word wet has been added. And then the insertion of uh, the insertion of a nucleotide. So if you look at this last sentence, we're talking about the insertion of something. What has it done? To the entire sentence, it's made the entire sentence unintelligible. We have B1, but now the Q has been added in front of the B and it's shifted everything that way. So now we have this which is not a word and this which is not a word because everything has moved one letter to the right. So the change of only one mutation is called a substitution or a uh, base substitution. The others are referred to as frame shifts. Uh, single cell anemia, some uh, different mutations cause recognizable diseases. The top is normal re red blood cells. You see that the normal red blood cell, uh, when red blood cells are being made, the protein is protein, glucine, glucine, making the proper looking red blood cells. In sickle cell, you see there is a change right here that T has been changed to an A. So instead of protein, glucine, glucine, we now have protein, valine, glucine, which instead of cells looking like this, the cells clump together looking like that. And that is indicative of sickle cell anemia. Uh, some mutations occur spontaneously. Again, others are caused by muti mutagens, mutagens. Uh, which are external uh, agents such as chemicals like smoke, radiation, x-rays, all of those things can lead to this. In a genetic lab, when we did this, we were actually exposing these flies to a certain chemical. I don't remember what the chemical was, but we, we, uh, we basically fed them their food, was laced with this chemical, and produced this offspring. Uh, some mutations, uh, which are, are not usually harmful, uh, most mutations are useful, many are beneficial. For example, mutations can create genetic variations needed for evolution, it can increase an individual's reproductive success. Plant breeders often include mutations to create new varieties of plants. Uh, the uh, navel orange, the orange that doesn't have any seed, that is a result of a mutation. Uh, this is a wheat plant. I think, uh, and we have produced wheat that is drought uh, resistant, that is moisture resistant. Uh, this is cotton. I'm not sure what they've done to the cotton, but uh, there's something to be done with that. All right, I'm going to stop now. I have some things to do for a few minutes. Uh, I will complete this chapter seven in chapter seven, part two. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, please contact me in either the course uh, content, no, excuse me, the course uh, contact link under the course messengers and or send an email to my trussell at uaptc.edu. Uh, see you later in the day with chapter seven, part two.